Okay, no, I put it in the chat. Thank you very much. It's uh, once again, it's fantastic being with you guys, even though it's now in a virtual, it's still, uh, I suppose, the right way to go. And uh, I'm going to try and take you out on a high today, as mentioned by a facilitator, and uh, see how we can get Lanky and, and, and show to you what Lanky actually did. I'm trying to go down uh, there. Try and uh, show you what Lanky did in changing the future of farming in the Western Cape in South Africa, because you had a very great impact on the way we do business, what we do, and how we do it. To, to start, uh, Land Care South Africa, just the purpose to see where how it fits so well with the international land care, is to promote the sustainable use and management of natural agricultural resources by engaging in community-based initiatives that support sustainability. That's a people, planet, and prosperity, leading to improved productivity, food security, job creation, and agro-ecosystems. You can imagine it's quite a mouthful. But when you put all these projects, and I'm going to show you some of the projects now, then you can draw the thread of how these projects actually link to uh, Land Care, Land Care International, and to all conventions, international conventions. So let's take this and uh, just give you more pictures. I saw I was in a bit late in the afternoon. I thought, well, then, you know, if there's guys like Rob around, then you probably have to show a lot more pictures, you know, to keep him engaged. So unfortunately, this is one of your, uh, uh, of our imports from you, the blue gum, which uh, when it is in the riparian zone, it really dominates the riparian zone. Here's an example of it for 50 years. And on the right, you can see this beautiful plant of all arts. It's actually the filters that is on the stem of the plant, which is underwater, which catches salt. And then that salt forms an island. And then the island obviously makes it meander. So then it meanders through that. So let's see how it, let's see how, let's take it from the top because one of our principles is how we connect from the ground right up to the top. And let's take it from the top and see how it links to biological diversity. So if you look at the term of biological diversity and uh, the fruits of billions of years of evolution shaped by natural processes and increasing by influence of humans. So this is the web that we're living in. And in land care, it's one of the very few programs that I know of that links directly to this convention. So restoring natural systems like the one you saw just now is vital to get us going. Have a look at this now. So we're going to a river system and it's been completely uh, infested with blue gum and all our, let's say, 40, 50 varieties or species of indigenous plants are taken out. Then what we do is we come in and we take out the wood, we chip it, as you can see on the right-hand side, and in some cases, it's so badly degraded that we have to put in support structures to protect the river in the form of groins and uh, gabions to just get it back. And then obviously the restoration is the next step that follows. You cannot just stay with the mechanical side. It's like uh, an Orland Care book in South Africa. We used to just concentrate on building structures. And when land care was introduced to us in 1999, then you guys taught us that we have to invest in people, and that's exactly what we're doing, and in ecosystems, not just structure. So if you see how we link uh, the projects to the International Convention to Combat Desertification, and which are then lived out in the Sustainable Development Goals, it's it's 100%. We've really, even in our Karoo areas, in our areas of which are quite arid desert areas, we, this is exactly what we do. So these two conventions link 100% with the land care in South Africa. It was something that never linked before, and it's changed. We are different now. We, we, we're looking at, at conservation and at sustainable development as uh, completely in a different eye since 1999. Just to give you a look at some of the help, we're looking now at soil health, so soil health and soil fertility uh, we've got the chemical, physical, and uh, biological. So what we're doing now is we're measuring our indexes on the biological. So if you can see at the bottom of here, you've got these two speedometers. And this one over here is a system is bordering on progressive mode. These are two samples. This is one. 
This is the second one. This one is in progressive mode and it's, it's bordering on regenerative mode. So you can see there's completely two different uh, samples. This one on the right hand side, you can see is something where you're going to have incredibly little inputs. Your soil biology is of such an integrity that it's actually got a heartbeat. It, it's like an animal that has a heartbeat. There's so much life in that soil that it's moving forward. And it's very complex, as you guys know. But this is the world that we're going towards, and this is how we're changing, how we're farming. And not just looking at the chemical side. That we, we, We've measured that with our 100 years of cultivating some of these vineyards and orchards and dry lands, we've not built the soil. We've actually degraded it. So this is a big wake-up call for us since 1981, and we're slowly working on it more and more and having fantastic conferences on this and doing it on the ground, making that change. Right, so if you take the Western Cape, uh, the Western Cape is uh, one of six floral kingdoms. It's actually Cape Floristic region. It's one of the, it's the smallest uh, kingdom and it's probably the highest diversity of endemism. And it has uh, more than 9,000 plant species, of which 69% are endemic. This is our responsibility to conserve. This is how we've changed our minds, just to making structures to actually take the responsibility of this fantastic floral kingdom. And this is our responsibility and our unique uh, work that has been to link to this, to make sure that this is maintained. And it's quite tough, as you know, with most farmers in in uh, any area nowadays, they, they go for the maximum profit. And now you have to include this type of a conservation into them, you also have to give it a value so that they can value it and actually use it to generate funding. Just to give you an idea of some of the biggest structures we built, this is a structure in Allsluit, and this is a very good example, a practical example of payment of ecosystem services. So if you look down here, this is the downstream side, and there's the valley below. All those farmers that receive water from this structure do not pump from the river anymore, and they pay the farmers above the weir forever on their water license to keep it clean of alien invasive plants and to restore it back to the courts. So that's the type of payment of ecosystem services we're going for, a more practical approach. And then the town of Worcester is in the, in the, in the background there, and they will also be connected later that all the participants or the inhabitants in that town will pay for these farmers to keep the system clear. Because to clean this water, it looks black to you, but this water has got humic acid in it, which is, which is, uh, uh it happens in the Western Cape due to the faint horses you get to this. The water is like tea. So it's, but if you put it in your hand, it's completely clear. So that's the, that's the level of thinking that we're going towards. So look at some of the projects that link to those conventions and our smart agri project, the area-wide planning projects which we got from the United States and that we've uh, included in our land care methodology. So we've got Fruinland Water Users Association that does this. It's absolutely a fantastic example of people on the ground taking position, taking responsibility of everything in their area and they make sure that all the water and everybody that's got anything to do with the water has got, is, is catered through, through them and there's a responsibility take. The same with the Hamka Kuru special management area, the Berg and Sea, and then our traditional one, which you probably know, is the Simonsberg land care area wide planning, which has been going on for many years. And it is an exceptional one. It is really, it's now got fire management, it's got security. It's got alien projects, it's got several funding sources that are helping them, and then it's going on from strength to strength. And this, through all our markets being affected and everything, is quite exceptional. Then we've got a conservation agriculture one, and I showed you the slide, and also looking at cover crops, which is a brilliant way of, of building soil fertility. Then we've got a land care EMPR and nine rivers, and that you wouldn't understand that EMPR is the Environmental Management Plan. So what has happened now in the last 20 years is this year they gave us the 
Natural Environmental Management Act, this on NEMA Act, has delegated land care, that any projects of land care, the environmental, uh, uh, in, environmental audit and uh, approval for those works can be approved by land care. It's quite mind-boggling to have something like this. And we're busy with one at the moment that's doing it for about uh, 600 hectares of land, which we're trying to direct the development and not reactively look at it, so it's proactive. And we're very far in that. Then the land care area wide planning projects with all the buying from the landowners and then moving towards the restoration. And then our other land care projects would link very well are the river care, felt care, soil care, junior care, as you guys have got in Australia as well, junior care, and the conservation agriculture. There is just to give you an idea of all the type of projects that we've got in the spread. So the Western Cape boundary is that black line, and you can see all the soil care, felt care, and water care projects, as well as the junior land care and conservation agriculture. So we've got a good spread. And we've got officials out there in the coal face. That's what makes the difference. Otherwise, if they're all in head office, you get very little done in your border areas. So how do we link to these international conventions at SMART? We've got some lovely community care projects. Rietpoort, Ebenezer, Wuppertal, Genadendal, Stofkra. You won't know these, but these are old areas that they've, that they've used before. Then the Upper Breeder River Collaboration Extension Group. So this has been born out of land care. It's, it's, it's how do we work with all these government officials in one group? And this they've done very carefully by making this extension group. We also have one in the lower part of the Sona Ent and Breeder River. Then the EMPR, land care of opening virgin land and the NEMA legislation. And then I've got a very exciting project that I'm trying to get off. It's a YET project. It's a youth empowerment through training. So it's a project that I've got several partners that have been taught to me by land keys. You must use your private non-government organizations that are effective that move so quickly. So I've got four of them. And in this pilot, we want to train 200 people and first get them mentors and they must be youth and they must be unemployed and teach them skills and teach them until they can do it. So we teach them several skills soft skills and technical skills so that after a year they go to their mentor for another year and then they either stay with their mentor or they'd be able to open their own small enterprise and work within that division. I'm very excited about this. I hope I'm going to get it going. Uh, the the uh, Director General of the province is also very excited as well as the head of the, head of the department. So we're slowly looking at this and designing it so that we can implement in the ground. Yeah. Unemployment in the Western Cape, most of the youth are unemployed. You can't believe it. It's something we have to really look at. And because we're doing land care and we're doing a social component, now for the first time, we can look at that. Not the first time, for many years now, but otherwise beforehand, if you were just building structures, you would not look at that. But now due to land care being our main priority, we look at that. Right, just to give you a few on the left hand side, you can see that uh, these uh, reeds, I think they come, they're Spanish reeds, and they infest the, the river system. They just dry up every drop that goes in that system. We carry on for kilometers. So that's the one project on the right. You can see desertification happening in our central Karoo arid area. These areas, these bare patches, and they could be a bit saline grow, and in the drought, they've, in the last years of seven drought, they've really grown extensively. So we're looking at ways testing the soil. We now have to fix it, and we're going to pilot that this year and see if we can get it going and then put out the, one of these high-flying drones, survey it, and then put out a program in a disaster management to see if we can address this problem and restore these lands or this felt area into, into its natural vegetation as, as much as we can. So we'll probably go for hardy uh, pioneer crops to try and get uh, indigenous into these areas that it's as natural as possible and that uh, obviously the hardy ones are less palatable so we've got a good chance of them surviving and then covering obviously with a lot of the dead bush that we've got there and that will give us a seven year start to sort of building the soil carbon in the soil.
Right, so by that formation, if you see, there is the Khamka Karoo. Can you imagine it, that we just call it the land care? You can see over there, we've got our land care partners, the Western Cape government, as well as Cape Nation. Now we've got the vultures on with uh, with our, our wildlife partners. We've got two or three of the wildlife partners on. We made a land care area wide planning. So a group of farmers, a community are working together, and they decided they're going to take this a step further and make it a special management area. You cannot believe we didn't say you must do that, which is not part of what we put out. But by giving the power and uh, the leadership to the community, that's the type of innovation they come up with. On the right hand side, that's your blue gun, ladies and gentlemen. It comes from uh, Australia. It grows in our rivers. And now we seem to get up to 16% of our big logs. We know how to treat them, how to dry them. And it's the best hardwood you can make furniture of. They make a lot of hardwood furniture for that. So we've got that going. Just to show you on this left hand side, this is an area we've cleaned two years ago. And this is the area we still have to clean. So it's like a before and after. There's the river system. You can imagine this little stream going through those type of blue gum trees. There'll be no water left after a kilometer. They just suck everything up. So when we get to our indigenous, we're going to be replanting and putting it in. On the right, you can see our community projects, putting in sun pumps for them and training them how to maintain. This is a very exciting uh, innovation that we've got. And that is turning this, this biomass into energy. So you can see this flame over here is from, that is the gas that's come from wood chips. And as you can see, here's the cost of it. So we're trying to, we're not trying, we've got the technology now to replace coal with chips. And here's the prices. And these prices, there is gas, and this is alien fuel, which is the chips. And these prices are before this latest price hike in uh, diesel and in energy. So you can imagine it was uh, cheaper to do. You get a lot more carbon credits for it. You also get a tax uh, uh, alleviation if you use this type of technology. So this is where we're going. This company also won the Climate 360 Award. It's fantastic to have something like that on board. And here's a nice table where we can put some, you know, uh, I suppose you can you can put this outside in the garden. It'll, it'll last for many years. And you can have some nice meals outside. Also made from, this is the off-cut that you wouldn't make from planks. You can see at the end of the, of the tree. Right. We're actively restoring the landscape and we're getting there. So you can see on the left hand side with the fire, we're working, we're in the fire, we're making the things happen. And if you look on the right, this is our end product. So we're getting back to this pond meat and this natural environment that cleans and filters the water and is a much more sustainable solution. Thank you very much for listening to me, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Francis. I have to look at you over my over the horizon a bit here. Um, do we have any questions either in the room or online for Francis? Just for a few minutes. No. That, we'll, we'll go over here first. Over there. But then we'll get you. Don't you worry. Thank you. Hi there, Francis. My name is Lauren. Um, you've, um, you've mentioned a number of uh, weeds or species of plant native to Australia that are now burdening you in South Africa. On the reverse front, we have African lovegrass in this country uh, now and um, <laughs> we're really struggling to find um, ways to control it. Do you have any tips on that? Yes, no, thank you for that. Now, we, we have uh, exported, I suppose, or we have imported also a lot of species that are now dominant there because their natural enemies are not there. So I think the love grass is Aragostus curvilla. I think that's what its name is. It is a tough pioneer. It's not very palatable. Uh, when it's young, it, it could be palatable. It's good for for, um, uh, let's say, putting on the ground and sort of stabilizing the ground to the next level. 
But it's a tough one because any weed that's, uh, or what you see is weed, any plant that's out of its natural habitat doesn't have its, uh, its natural enemies anymore, which makes it a bit complex. So I think the worst one we gave you was something you call double G, is we call it double G. And, uh, I don't know why it was exported. I think at that time they thought it, it's got such a high iron content and the iron content is, uh, but, you know, so the leaves were used for that, but it's a terrible thorn, and it's something that you've been uh, battling with for a long time. I'll just tell you that with this newest research that we've been doing along the rivers, we found, for example, that where we cleaned a piece of river and burnt it, then it uh, it really looks degraded. And the first thing that comes up is uh, what you would call uh, um, is a bad weed that we got from, I think it came... Uh, I think it came, it's a burr, and I think it came from uh, from Europe or somewhere, and it just dominates the landscape 100% cover. And what we saw later is if you leave it and you start introducing the indigenous plants, now after 10 years, it's gone down to about 5% of what it was. So if you listen to some of the experts that talk about weeds, they say a weed tells a story. So this would be classified as a weed for you. So telling your story, there's something wrong with your environment. And maybe the weed is going to help you change that environment, that there's a lot more carbon in the soil, and then it will not grow in a, in a, in a carbon-rich area. Thanks, Francis. Uh, Pamela, you had a question here, down the front. And, and once again, anyone listening online that wants to type a question in, we're monitoring that as best we can. Thanks, Francis. It's a fascinating presentation. Um, I'd like to turn to the social aspects of the work you're doing and ask if you could comment on the challenges that you have in engaging with the landholders and also particularly because you mentioned um, working in an area that um, is a wine-growing area. I'm just interested in the... Um, the social composition of the, the landholders that you work with um, in terms of ra the race, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, no, thank you for that. It's, it's one of the toughest areas that you can get, and that is the extension. So the extension to take this idea that we have and to incorporate it into farmers is very tough. But once you've got it and you maintain it, then you've got 100%. So to give you an example of that before I answer the rest of your question, is there's an area of 75 kilometers in one of our rivers that has been cleared of alien invasive plants. But before it was started with, then the landowners were on board and they were prepared to maintain the game. And this 75 kilometers, they've maintained the game. This 75 kilometers ends in a wetland of 730 hectares which is filtering every single litre of water that comes down and goes to the farmers of about 5,000 hectares below this wetland. So extension, the whole time, you must be on the ground, you mustn't be a tourist, you must be a land care official in a bucky, that's a ute in your case, and you must have your boots on the ground. That's the number one thing. You can't just come and visit the places. To the different, uh, most of the wine farmers over here are still, uh, the race is still white. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we haven't changed as much as we would. We would really like to have changed a lot more, but we've got a lot more of different races in, and we've got a lot more communities that are not white, that are completely, that have come back from our, our history, and we've worked with them, and that's the community care projects we've got. It's... Uh, your extension skills has to be as finely owned working with them as working with any other farm. You really have to be on the ball. You have to uh, support and support the whole time and then change their practice. So it is, it, you, you put it on the nail, you know, you can do all of this work. And if you do not have buy-in from the community, you have no sustainability. So it's a very good question. It's something that we're working on the whole time, and you must realize most of the staff have been trained as engineers. 
uh, to get an engineer. I don't know if there's anybody in the in the audience that's an engineer, but to get him to speak to people is could be challenging in itself. But no, nevertheless, when they do get it right, they they absolutely they are good. One more question up the back here. Hi, Two more. just wondering who's the beneficiary of the timber production and associated steam production? Like, is it community groups who uh, get the value from that? And how long, if that's a sort of a small scale industry, how long will it last for? Because obviously you're trying to clear those trees, you're not trying to put them back into the landscape. So it must have an end point. And then at the end of that, you can tell us whether or not all those trophies behind you are land care awards. I thought that they'd be cricket trophies, wouldn't they? <laughs> yes, no, thank you for that question. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, the research and development was done by a private entrepreneur that is um, an accountant on that specific one. There's also technologies in Italy and as well as Germany that do similar things, not exactly the same. At this stage, it is a small scale and they're going to start uh, expanding their production. And uh, the amount of uh, alien biomass that we have is probably about a million hectares. So we've got some way to go before we can to get rid of all of that. And we've got another million hectares of uh, in Botswana and uh, Namibia and in the northern parts of Southern Africa, so of, of Prosopis, which came from the Southern African side. So it's true uh, to a certain extent we'd be able to carry on for everybody's doing the stock taking to find out how long we'll carry on with something like that. But by the time we finish with that, we want to change over to something more uh, environmentally friendly even before that. So this is just one of the environmentally friendly things. We're going to go to wind and to solar. We've got plenty of solar, the same as you guys. You know, we just have to, we've got plenty of sun. We've got little solar. So let's just go and use those type of technologies instead of using coal. Coal is uh, it's really bad. And a lot of the mines and the, the magnesium and all these things is also stuff that has to be looked at completely in a different light to try and stop the pollution. Now, I don't know if you're looking at the walls behind me, but I can say at the last conference we had in Bloemfontein in 2018 before uh, COVID, we won in every single one of our uh, applications in the Western Cape got an award. So there was no other province that even got close to us. In fact, we got more awards than I can say the other provinces together. So it was, it was fantastic. You've got some fantastic people on the ground. And that's another lesson that you, that you must remember is very important. Uh, land care in South Africa is in a government organization. Land care internationally is more in a private, non-governmental organization. And the strength lies in that. The strength lies in the people on the ground activated and doing the stuff. So you guys, have taught us an immense amount, and that's one of the big lessons we've been taught. And so the whole time we're trying to develop the non-governmental organisations. Just a little bit over time, Rob, so you're the last question. A... <coughs> Amazingly kind. Uh, hi, Francis. Could you confirm w uh, that at the South African land care conferences, you run a parallel conference for the school children of the, of the nation? I think people will be amazed and I'll just underline how wonderful in Africa people do junior land care. But could you just give us that sort of confirm the participation of large numbers of school kids in the national conferences? Thank you. Yes, hello, hello uh, Rob. It's good, good hearing you. I thought you were, you were sort of simmering in the background over there waiting to, you know, to... I thought you were going to ask a rugby question, but that will happen on this weekend. We'll sort that out today, so... Uh, keep the playing field open at the moment. Now, the Junior Land Care Program is, well, it's, I don't know, it started uh, with our national program and it's something that we started in the Western Cape and we brought it to the national side. And we started first with camps and then with competitions at schools. And a lot of the prizes behind me are very old prizes that we used to give to schools for putting in an essay. So it used to fit in 100% with their curriculum. But if you come to the National Land Care Conference now, 
every uh, province brings about 30 school children up to that uh, conference. I had the privilege of opening that session of the junior landscape. And I can tell you now, the one in Bloemfontein, I think there were more teachers, parents, and uh, people involved in junior land care than in the main conference at one time. So it's incredibly vibrant. You cannot believe. And then we have competitions with with uh, talking, with drama, with so forth, videos and stuff. It's, 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 it's really a lot. So you've got 30 times the nine, you've got 270, you know, people. It, it's unbelievable. You can't believe the, the participation that you've got from that. And it's something that goes back to the school. And then they want it every year. They want us to help them and uh, uh, participate in this. So it's a fantastic way of actually getting to the youth. You know, and when you get to the youth, and these are school children, they will never forget these lessons. I can tell you, I can take so many examples of them saying they will never, ever forget these lessons. So that's part of it. It's quite a challenge taking a lot of children up with you. So you know, to these different events. They have to choose your accommodation uh, appropriately and everything. And there's no, there's never been an incident. It's always worked very well. Thank you, Francis. Uh, look, as, as your day is beginning, our day is ending. Um, thank you very much for your presentation today. Could we just put our hands together and... and...